So anyway, um, we're back. It is week five. Uh, the topic last week was we were learning how to sort of recompose our UI. And uh, we did that with fragments. And you know, fragments are the main topic of your section this week. So last week, we didn't have section. This week, we're back. We do have sections. So some of you are going to go tonight. So make sure to show up for that. Um, you will practice taking an existing activity and making it into fragments so you can rearrange the UI and rotate it and stuff like that. We also saw that you could uh, use sort of a layout inflator and an XML template to sort of recreate or inflate uh, a piece of UI that was reused on the screen. Um, and I, I always wonder like whether it's clear like what the difference is between those two topics because they both seem like they're about like you know, sort of reshaping your UI more dynamically. So uh, I wanted to ask you guys that, like, do you kind of understand the difference of when you would use a fragment versus when you would use a layout inflation kind of thing like we did on Thursday? Like, what's your sense of the difference between those two things? You didn't listen to me because you're so excited about baby crap, huh? I didn't reach you. Uh, did you have your hand up? Oh, yeah. Can you repeat the question? Sure. The question is just um, what's kind of the major difference between having a fragment versus having like a, a layout inflation, like we did these little flags from different countries. Why would you use a fragment versus why would you use a layout inflate? What's the difference between the two of them? Do you have an answer to that? Yeah, I think fragments um, are, are better at handling events. Um, like lots of events and uh, inflators are uh, just like a layout that you can paste on. Yeah, I think that's that's a pretty big difference between the two. When you inflate a layout, you get widgets, you get an appearance, you get a set of you know buttons and images or whatever, uh, but they don't inherently respond to any events. You can make them respond to events by attaching listeners to them after you inflate them, but it's kind of like manual drudgery to do that. A fragment is more like a self-contained thing that has a layout, it has some widgets, it also has certain events that it's responding to, it has its own life cycle that it gets created and paused and resumed and destroyed, and so it's more of a like self-contained unit with state and event behavior. And a layout inflation is more just like widgetry. Yeah, I think that's a good way to describe it. Also, just intuitively, I think the size is often a, a, a separator here. Like fragments are kind of bigger usually. You have more stuff going on, more fragment, more widgets in a fragment. A layout inflator could be a big thing, but it might not be. Uh, I don't know if I really said this last week, but fragments are somewhat controversial. Uh, there are people who code for Android or even companies that just don't like fragments. They just think they suck and they're stupid, and so they they don't ever use them. And if they ever want to like rotate their layout or have different layouts, instead of doing that with fragments, they use this layout inflator. Uh, sort of dynamic UI layout style that we saw on Thursday and they just do that at large scale and they just manually attach all the event listeners like you can do that um, so it's a little bit of a split in the Android community like are fragments good or are fragments bad and if you want to get down the rabbit hole on that you can google it like uh, you know certain companies like I think the company Square who makes a lot of mobile stuff they uh, they don't use fragments for anything so it's interesting to kind of read they'll write these articles on medium.com like here's why we never use fragments at Square and you're like, oh, okay you know or then some other company will come back and say here's why fragments are awesome and so it's kind of if you if you care you can kind of read more about that but um, okay anyway so that's the topic that we did last week and that's what section will be about um, I will say you know for section uh, you, you'll have to give us some feedback on how section goes this week because you know you might remember the lecture I did on fragments at a Pokemon Pokedex thing and it was a lot of stuff to do a lot of files a lot of editing and like it took me a bit of work to get that to run and I sort of barely <laughs> barely got it to run and turn and rotate by the end of that uh, lecture and so I think that you know for you guys to do that in section we're hopeful that we made a version of that for you to work on that you'll be able to do in 50 minutes you know but I'm kind of curious to see how it goes because it's it's one of the more like tricky bulky topics you know so let, let us know how, how it goes for you this week okay so the topic now for for today and going forward is I'm going to talk to you about libraries oh a question yeah go ahead yeah, I just have a, a general question because you were talking about people making apps and companies so we can only publish Android apps in Android Studio but obviously there's a lot of people who use iPhones 
when you're at companies like that, do they like use a different software so they can publish both Android and iPhone, or do they just like remake the app in the iPhone version of it? Ah, uh, okay. So um, yeah, in case the video didn't pick up, you're asking like companies that deploy for both mobile OSs, like iOS and Android, do they write the app twice, or do they have some sort of common code that is used for both? Um, mostly they write it twice. Um, I am going to talk late in the course about there are some cross-platform toolkits that you theoretically write one base of code, and then you press a magical button, and then you get an iPhone app, and you get an Android app, and maybe you also get a desktop app or a website or anything you want. Like uh, One example of such a toolkit is called React Native. There's another one called Flutter. There are a couple of other, these are, these are things that are uh, attracting some interest right now for obvious reasons because like you guys who are in this class, like you're learning how to make Android apps and then of course you go pitch your startup and then they're gonna say, where's the iPhone version? And you'll say, I didn't take that class yet. I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> right? So uh, yeah, it's like an obvious next step is like, well, what, what if I want it to work for everybody's phone? I can't, the Android app cannot just be deployed as an iPhone app, there's a totally different code base and coding model and languages and stuff. So um, typically, generally speaking, you would have to like rewrite the app from scratch in iOS uh, using the Swift programming language, um, which uh, is not that different from Kotlin because Kotlin basically ripped off Swift, I think. But, um, you know, but still, you'd have to rewrite it. And um, the good news, I, I think, you know, most companies do just rewrite the app. And the reason, that, that probably sounds just awful, and it sort of is, but, one thing that we'll see later, like pretty soon in this course, is that an app often has a back end. Like your app has a UI and it has some events you respond to, but then a lot of what is happening in the app is driven by requesting data, displaying the data, allowing the user to manipulate the data. And that usually comes from some you know, cloud or server or something. It comes from some API that your app is connecting to. And so that would be shared. You would make that once and your iOS app would talk to that, your Android app would connect to that, and your website would connect to that. And actually a lot of the bulk of what your app is doing might be there, and just showing the pretty buttons and stuff is on each. So it's kind of like you don't have to rewrite every single thing from <coughs> scratch, but you, you basically do have to rewrite the app. Now, I did just say there are these like cross-platform uh, magical toolkits. I kind of want to defer that to later in the course when I actually lecture on it, but like, Long story short, like you can sort of write it once and run it everywhere now, but there are some like major cons to doing that. I mean, it, you get the best iOS app if you just write an iOS app. You get the best Android app if you just write an Android app. If you try to write one thing that magically becomes all of them, it sort of, it can become kind of a mediocre version of them all in some cases. So there are some pros and cons, but we'll, we'll learn about it a little bit. Um, also, frankly, if I were gonna teach you that, like the sort of general one, like React Native or Flutter or something, this thing that emits an Android app and it emits an iPhone app, then like all of the stuff we've been learning wouldn't matter because <laughs> you wouldn't write the code uh, this way. You wouldn't use Kotlin. You wouldn't use a lot of these same commands and functions and libraries that we've been learning. So it would sort of invalidate a lot of the stuff we're doing in some ways. So um, that would be a different course. In fact, I think, does anybody know, wasn't there, there was a course, a student taught course on React Native, I think, recently. I forget what the number was, like CS91SI or something like that. Anyway, um, yeah, so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about libraries. and. The reason we're going to talk about that is because, well, there's a lot of really useful libraries that help you do cool stuff in Android. And, um, you know, I'm not going to cover the majority of them, but I want to give you a taste for it so that when you need to go code an app someday and you find a cool library that you'll know kind of how to get started. So let me jump to my slides here. So, yeah. Uh, Libraries, I mean, the thing about libraries is that uh, I'm talking kind of third-party libraries, like the Android Studio and the, and the Kotlin Android API already comes with a lot of classes and functions and thingies that you can talk to. So I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about extra functionality that other people have written and they want to distribute to you. Um, there's a really nice system in the Android ecosystem called Maven. And um, there's another system called Gradle, and they, they all kind of interact where you can basically just in your project, I'll show you in a second, you can just declare like, I want to use this library, I want to use that library. And if you say it in the right syntax, it will just connect to some web-based repository 
and it will just download the library and set it up for you in your project and it'll just like work. And then when you deploy your app to the emulator or to the phone or whatever, the library will just be in there and it'll just, it all just works, it's really cool. Um, you know, libraries can be kind of a pain in the ass in the wrong system where you, you have to like download them and install them and set them up and configure them and then, you know, a new version of a library comes out, you have to go download it again. And so that's a real mess. So I think most modern development flows try to have some kind of library management or dependency management system where you can just sort of say, I want this or this or that. Uh, you know, web dev has a pretty good system now where you can kind of install these different uh, packages and libraries as well. But anyway, um, there's lots of libraries. You can add them to your project. And uh, most of these libraries are free. And you know, there's different kinds of free. Like I, I'm not really here to talk about software licensing. You know, there's like free, like do you have to pay for it? And then there's free, like what rights do the authors grant you? Are you allowed <laughs> to put it in a product that you sell for money? Are you allowed to modify it? Are you, whatever, right? Are you, what are you allowed to do with it? Most of these libraries have pretty permissive MIT style licenses where you can kind of just do what you want with them. Um, so that's good. Anyway, there are libraries, they are cool. Uh, in general, if you want to add a library to your project, there is a file in a project called build.gradle. And I'll show you that file in just a minute. But you open up that file and there's a section of the file that says dependencies. And you just add a line to the section that says implementation. And then in quotes, you write the name of the library in a certain way. And um, you might say, well, what? It says your library file here. What do I put there? Well, I'm going to show you. Like a lot of times, if you find a library on the web, the web page for the library will say, here is the line of code that you need to paste into build.gradle. They'll just tell you exactly copy this and paste it into your build.gradle, and then you will have my library. You can use it. So that's like. Most cases, that's all you need to do to use one of these libraries. Now, where is this file? It is in the project. I, I have a project today. Um, oh, wait, this isn't the one. Sorry. Uh, close. It's called Puppy Power. Um, I've got dogs. I have three dogs and two cats and 1.5 children. And so I like dogs. And so I, I just grabbed some pictures of my dogs and I mean, it's kind of a dumb app. It's just like I wanted an app where you could choose a, a file and it would show you a picture of dogs. <laughs> so, I like dogs. Um, so that's what this app does. It's called Puppy Power. If you, if you want this code, it's on the web. The starter version of this code is on the web. Today's lecture in a zip file. Um, see, on the, on the project on the left here, they have different areas like your Java code and your, your layout and all that kind of stuff. There's also these files here called build.gradle. Now, um, do you remember what Gradle is? Do you remember in the ecosystem here of Android, do you remember what Gradle means or what it's for? I've mentioned it like very briefly once. Do you remember what? Yeah, it's like a it's like a build file or like a make file for the project. Yeah, like if you've taken a class like 107, you probably learn about like build systems or make files or something like that. Um, it's just it's a <coughs> Gradle is a system for compiling and building and packaging up your project. So like when you hit the run button it uses this Gradle system to figure out what classes do I need to compile and what layout XML files do I need to put in there and what raw resources need to pack in and drawable. It kind of handles all the like bundling and compiling and packaging. That's what Gradle does. So there's this file in your project called build.gradle. Now since everything is just 10% confusing for no reason in Android, there are two of them. And if you open them, they have different stuff inside. They sort of look like code. That's because they are code written in a language named Groovy. Um, there are two of these files, and I have to admit that every time I go to write an Android app, I always forget which one is which, and I still don't totally think I know why there are two of them. That's okay. Uh, the good news is that if you open the wrong one, it says, don't place your dependencies here. They belong in the other one. So, it's like, <laughs> thankfully, whoever did this, like, put a note that says, don't put this here. You want this thing that says dependencies, but this one's like, no, not me. So, okay, close him. In the other one, there's an area. I mean, there's all this other stuff in here. And I mean, some of this I know what it's for. Some of it I don't. It, it's like settings for your project. What version of Android are you targeting? What version of the app is this? What's your app called? Whatever, you know, stuff like that. Um, down here, there's an area called dependencies. Now, all this stuff, I didn't put this here. When I made my new project, this stuff was all already here. Oh, wait, I think. Actually, I might have added this one. <laughs> Let me delete that one. There. So all that stuff was there. 
uh, when I made a brand new project. And if you make a new project, your file will look like this too. But in these slides, if I say, hey, you know, add so-and-so line to your build.gradle in the dependencies section, I'm saying like, yeah, copy the line from the slide and then just like paste it in here into this file. And if you do that and then you save the file, it'll say like, your Gradle file has changed since the sync. You might need to sync the thing. So you click sync now. And when you click that, it will then like update everything. And if you added any new libraries, it'll go auto download them or whatever. So that's all you got to do. Then at the moment you finish syncing now, you can go to your code and start using the new classes or features of the library. It's pretty neat. So with all that said, let's learn about a couple of libraries. Ready? Um, here's a library called Picasso. Picasso is a library for manipulating images. <laughs> Uh, it's made by Square. Do you guys know Square? Square Tech Company. <laughs> is that the right thing to Google for? Uh, Square Financial Services. They make the Cash App. Um, you know, they're they're a Bay Area tech company. Uh, they're I think they started by the Twitter guy, right? Jack Dorsey, I think, started them. Anyway, whatever. He's a weirdo. He he does like uh, fasting and and uh, cold freeze treatments and stuff like that now. And he's got an even worse beard than me, but uh, enough about him. So uh, Square is a company that makes software and they release libraries because I guess they had to manipulate images in their Android apps and so they made a library for it. So if you want to use Picasso library in your project, there's a couple things you need to do. Now, you need to add this line to your dependency <coughs> file. That's the main thing that you need to do. So let me grab that. So I'll just triple click. Now wait, let me let me back up for half a second though. Like I'm telling you this and so you can listen to me or whatever, but I guess I want to emphasize that my main goal for today is not to make you some expert at any library. I just want you to not be afraid of libraries and I want you to be curious or interested to go try libraries. And so like I want you to understand that like how I figured that out is I just went to their page and it said so. Like if I just click here and if I go to this page, like it has a couple tutorials, like here's how to use this or whatever, but like somewhere on the page, depending, you know, whoever wrote the page, like somewhere on here, usually they're at the top or at the bottom, it'll say, if you want to put this in your project, then just add this to your Gradle file. So I found that and I just came back and pasted it into my slide. So like that's all I did, you know? And uh, how did I even know that there was such a thing as Picasso? I just Googled for like, what are the best image <laughs> libraries for Android? And I read a couple of reviews. So I'm just telling you like, this isn't rocket science here. So, you know, you copy this line and you paste it in here. And now if I say save and it says sync now and I click here, um, so it kind of like down here it does some like build stuff and now it's basically done and it downloaded it. I, it might have already had it because I was playing with this code earlier today in this project but basically it, if it needed to download it, it would download it and it's, it's done with that now. It's all you need to do. And now in your code here, uh, I don't really have any code per se but if I just tried to use this library I would say pick uh, so see it like found it. It's, it's there. Like that's all I needed to do. It exists now. Okay. So I'll show you more about how to use the library in a second. Um, there's a couple more things that you're supposed to do when you use this library. Uh, I'm going to come back to these in a second because I want to sort of see why we need them before I, before I add them to my project. But anyway, what is this library for? It's for image processing. Now, we have had images in our projects before. We had image views or image button. You display an image on the screen, right? That's not such a big deal. But there are some things that we haven't had that were maybe hard to do, like um, if there was an image on the internet, how could I get that image and then put that on the screen somehow? That, that would be nice to have. This thing helps you do that. Another thing would be like, well, I've got an image, but it's not the right size or it's not the right shape or I want to rotate. I want to do some manipulation to the image. This thing has a lot of functions for that. So just kind of image manipulation library. I think you'll find that a lot of apps deal with images, images that come from random places online or whatever. And so it's nice to have an image processing library. So uh, here's one example <laughs> of loading an image from the internet. You say, that, so th this looks a little weird. Let me explain what's going on here. Um, Picasso is the name of a class that you will now have access to once you set up this library. It has a method called .get. 
Um, that's called a, it's a, what's called a singleton design pattern, where like if you call get, it returns an object of type Picasso. And now once that get return, gets returned, you then call dot whatever on that object. So you can say, hey, Picasso object, please load this image. And then if you want to do something with it after that, you can say dot and call another method. And so um, if this looks weird, kind of what's happening here is that each method returns the same object to you over and over and over and over. Picasso.get returns the Picasso guy. And then you call load on him, and that also returns the Picasso guy. And then you call into, and that also returns the Picasso guy. And the reason that it does that is so you can chain them together and call them over and over and over. It's like a sequence of steps. And I, I think that style looks a little weird, but once you get used to it, it's not so bad. Um, so yeah, that's all you need to do to load an image and put it into an image view on the screen. So hey, let's do it. Show a cute puppy photo. Uh, I'll just paste here. Now it wants me to import, so I hit Alt Enter. And then um, you're supposed to write the variable name for an image view here, some kind of image view or image button. In my uh, layout here, what I've got is a I've got a heading and I've got a spinner that drops down with a list of images I might want to look at. And then here, oh wait, what's this thing? I don't want this, sorry. I was playing with something. Um, there, I've got an image view. There, I've got an image view that takes up the whole rest of the screen and it doesn't initially show any particular image, okay? So if I wanted the image at this URL to appear on the screen there, um, I could say, well, this is called photo image, the ID for this image view here. So I could just say into photo image. That's it. So then as the activity is loading up, it connects to the internet, it downloads that file, puts that image onto the screen. Okay? That's all you got to do. Um, before I run it, I do want to go back. Uh, remember when I first started showing about the Picasso library, I had these other things I said you might need to do when you're setting it up. So I want to talk about this for a second. Um, I haven't given you a proper lecture on permissions. Um, I will come to that. Maybe even Thursday I'll get to it. But apps sometimes have to request permissions. Like you install an app and it says, this app needs to read your contacts and it needs to use your internet connection. You know, like it asks you, is it OK if this app does those things, right? Um, and that's because you know you don't want to install an app that you think is just a stupid game, but really it's like reading all your text messages and sending them to to North Korea or something, right? Like you you don't want to be surprised by what the app is doing, right? Um, so the way that that works, like you you have seen how that works as a user, those pop-ups that ask for permission. And actually, you might know if you use Android regularly and you've seen it lately, sometimes you're in the middle of using the app. Like I was just describing an install screen that says, hey, do you want to install this? Because it needs to access your phone list and your, your text or whatever, right? That's one model. The other model is like while you're using the app, you might be about to do something. Like you ever, you're using like uh, Instagram or something and you, you're swiping up and down. You accidentally swipe a little bit to the side and it jumps you to that god awful side swipe screen that you didn't mean to pop up. And it, pop, it tries to run your camera and then it pops up this box and it says like, Instagram wants to use your camera, allow or deny, right? So there's kind of this like permission aspect to mobile apps. And I'm going to teach you all about that and what the different permissions are and how do you ask for them and stuff. But um, so for today, to use this one library, you have to have permission to use the internet connection on the phone. And if you want to ask for that permission, the way you do that is you have to copy this line of XML code and you have to paste it into your Android manifest file. The Android manifest is like an XML file that we've seen once or twice before. It contains uh, information about your project and stuff. So if you go back to your project and you click manifest and you click Android manifest, up here at the top, you say, I want permission to use the internet connection. Um, if you do not put this in here, the Picasso app will try to connect and it'll fail. It'll just be blocked. And so your code will just crash or something, throw in an exception. Yeah. I wanted to ask, like, what if you don't ask for the permission? Like, will is it like difficult from a legal aspect or just the technical aspect? Of it? Well, if you don't ask for the permission, 
So every Android app is running like a kind of a sandbox. Like the operating system is watching your app run. And if your app tries to do something that needs certain permission, but you don't have the permission, it will stop your app and it won't let you do it. So you can insert code that says delete file or connect to internet or, or read address book. You can put that in your code for your app. But then the moment your code tries to do that, if your app doesn't have permission to do that, your app will throw an exception and basically it'll crash or block your app from doing that. So it's not, I mean, I think you're asking like, is it more of a legal or whatever, but it's like the app just won't be allowed to do it. So it, I think what you might be thinking is it's like a consent, like a user license agreement. I want you to read these terms and conditions and I want you to agree to them or something. And a lot of us don't read those. We just say, okay, or something. So that's more like legal liability. This is like, if you say, okay, or agree, you as the user have granted the app the permission to do this and now the code won't crash the code will be allowed to do that so it doesn't matter it's not so much about liability it's just like the app will be blocked or not blocked or something like that um, again like there's more to say about it but like some permissions are considered very sensitive like hey this app wants to read all your email is that okay and it'll make you consent to that and there's other permissions that are less sensitive like this app wants to use the internet that's pretty like innocent like most mobile apps are going to use the internet a lot of them are so if you declare that your app wants that permission that you would like that permission it doesn't like make the user um, it doesn't pop up a question about that while the app is running it just as long as the user installed the app then it assumes they are okay with that basically so anyway I have to say that I'm, I want to use the internet or else it won't let me download these images from the internet and there's one more thing and actually this is <laughs> when I was preparing the, my lecture for this quarter like it took me, <laughs> I got stuck on this for like an hour. Um, these images that I want to download, like in the in the code here, if you just copy and paste this URL, I mean, this is a real uh, URL to some picture of, that's my old former dog, Deezy. Uh, I don't have her anymore, but there she is. Um, so that URL, if you look closely at the URL, it's HTTP colon Marty Step. Now, I don't know how many of you have learned like web stuff or web dev, but like there's also HTTPS, right? You know the difference, right? The S is the secure one. Well, so some websites are encrypted and they're secure and stuff and some are not. And <laughs> my website is not <laughs> because you have to get like encryption keys for that. And I don't, I don't have the time for that sort of thing. So um, also, I don't really care if you have a secure connection to read my puppy pictures, right? So I just don't have the S here. Um, apparently, since the last time I taught the course, they've added a new security restriction to Android that um, by default, you can only connect to secure sites because they don't want your app to be unsecure, insecure, whatever. Um, so if you want to be able to use regular HTTP URLs like this, you also have to go in here to your, to your um, XML and insert this uh, Android uses clear text traffic equals true here in this application tag. <laughs> that means you can use HTTP and not HTTPS, so whatever. You probably, if you were writing a real app that connected to some real data source or whatever, you probably wouldn't need this because most real data sources will have a secure traffic connection, but I don't. So, okay, anyway, now I think I'm all set up. So I think this will show this picture. Let me, let me see if this runs. I, I think that's all I need. I mean, I'm talking a lot, but at the end of the day, it takes two lines of, three lines of code to like do this. That's the whole point, right? Is that these libraries are supposed to make it easier to do stuff. So um, at the end of the day, we talk a lot and there's only a few lines of code to show for it, but let's, let's try it out. I'm hoping it'll work. There's Daisy, all right. So um, I was, I'm always a little nervous when I give lectures that depend on internet connection because you know this campus somehow despite being the best university in the planet, they can't afford Wi-Fi that doesn't suck for some reason. But thankfully the Wi-Fi gods have decided to be merciful today <laughs> and I have a connection. But um, so there it is, there's an image, there's a picture of Daisy. Now I don't know if I'm convincing you that this is useful yet because like you might say, well why don't I just download the picture of Daisy, put it in my drawable res folder and then load that from r.drawable.daisy or whatever and like yeah sure you could do that but like why is this better than doing that do you think what do you think 
saves memory space for your own app. Like, so the app doesn't take as much disk space. That's true. If you download 100 images and stuff them all in your resource folder, then your app is going to be larger to install. That's true. What other reasons? Yeah. You don't have to like update the app every time you want to change a picture. Sure, I mean, if you bundle them into your app, they're very like fixed and rigid, and if you ever have new pictures, you can't, you'd have to like redeploy a new version of your app. So if this is some sort of dynamic content where people are uploading new doggy pictures all the time, then yeah, you would definitely want the app to be able to get new data, and so yeah, that's what, you'd rather be able to get it from some remote source like the web or something like that. So yeah, that's the main thing, dynamic and, and the size, those are the reasons why this is better. Um, Okay, so that's like just the, the canonical simple example of Picasso. Let me show you a couple other things it can do. It's not just for like loading an image. You can also, okay Daisy, there we go. Here, here's some of the methods Picasso has. Um, you can load from all kinds of different places. You actually can load by passing in an ID. So it could be a file in the resource drawable folder if you want. Um, because you might want to load that image from your app's internal resource area and then modify it in some way. So you could do that. Um, there's some other stuff here. You don't use a lot of these methods very often. I'll talk about some of them later, but the one I use the most is you can set this logging enabled property. Like sometimes if it isn't working, you want logging, it'll dump out messages to the console in Android Studio and it'll tell you like if something's not working or whatever. Um, what you probably want are these image processing methods. So we did one called into, which puts the image into a image view on the screen to so display it, you know. But you can also do all these different things. You can resize the image, you can rotate it, you can stretch it, and all these kind of things. So um, there's also something where you can apply a transformation. It's like an affine matrix type of transformation. You can shear it and scale it, and and uh, all these different kinds of uh, you know matrix-based transformations you can apply. Basically, lots of nice stuff you can do here. So just to give you a quick demo of that. You know, if I've got Daisy right there, uh, maybe what I do is I, um, you know, after I load the Daisy picture, I dot resize her to be, I don't know, uh, 500 by 300. And then I dot rotate her by uh, 90 degrees. It says it wants it in float, so I think floats end with an F, whatever. Um, so now I think if I rerun the app, hopefully I'll get sort of a <laughs> mushed, rotated picture of the dog. I don't know. Not the most practical thing, but hey, there we go. <laughs> Great. See? Perfect. Just what I wanted. Uh, it, so let's see. Did it do that in the order I wanted? I have to think about that. I would have thought that it would have been taller. I might be, maybe the ordering isn't what I expect it to be, but hey, you know, whatever. You can play with these different transformations. There's a lot of different stuff you can do to these images. Um, it's helpful if you want them to fit in a certain amount of screen space or something like that. So, okay, that's great. Now, in terms of this, like let's, I, I think there's, is there one or two more slides on Picasso? Let me, let me kind of finish the slides on that. Um, yeah, okay, so let's use this real quick to um, make the app display different pictures of, of dogs, okay? So eventually what I want to do, like long term, is if you go to the, the web space here and you delete the what file it is, you know, you just say Marty Step slash dogs, it's a bunch of pictures of dogs. And <laughs> yeah, you can go look at those if you want. But um, if, you, if you look at those pictures, like I would want to know, can you please give me a list of them all? So if I were doing this right, I would have like some kind of, uh, you know, web-based uh, API or something. And I don't want to do that today. I want to cover that later. But I've got a thing called files.txt that has the names of all these files. So like in theory, what I would want to do here is I would want to connect to the internet, grab this file. It has the names of all the images. I want to split it up by slash n and like you get all the names of all the image files. I want to offer all of those file names as options to the user. And then if they pick one, I want to go fetch that image on the internet and display it on the screen. You know what I mean? So I want to offer these options, let them view any one of these pictures. That, yeah? Do your dogs love Facebook pages? Do my dogs what? Do they all have Facebook profiles? Uh, do my dogs all have Facebook profiles? <laughs> yeah, uh, Barney, Clyde, and Abby, I believe they all do, yeah. Um, <laughs> Barney, Step, Facebook. Is he on Google? Paco step. I don't know if I can load Facebook. I don't know who's been like in my DMs or whatever, but Barney step. 
There's my dog Barney. And Abby. I don't know if I have any Abby pictures. Abby's my French bulldog. And then Clyde is my <laughs> black color dog. Yes, they all have Facebook pages. And then Daisy is now called Daisy Wolk, because I lost her in the divorce. <laughs> That's a joke, but it's kind of half true. Um, so yeah, Daisy is with her mom, Jessica. Daisy used to be me and Jessica's dog. Now Daisy is Jessica's dog. I can tell you that story later. But yeah, so those are the dogs in the, in the system here. And I believe they all have Facebook pages, yes. <laughs> so um, anyway, I've got various pictures here, yeah. If you would like to friend them, I know, uh, I am sure later they will accept your friend request, although not during class. Um, so you get the idea, I want to download this list of images, display them to the user as options. They can pick one and then I will display that image for them, right? That's the goal. So uh, I don't, I have not yet taught you how to connect to the internet and like download this text file and then read it, the text out of it. I haven't taught you how to do that yet. I want to show you that in a minute. So for the meantime, I think what I want to do is just hard code what the file names are, but I want to make it so the app offers them as um, choices. And then when you choose one, I want to load it on the screen using Picasso, okay? So how I want to do that is um, in Android Studio, in my strings.xml, I've created an array called puppy images that has some of these files in it. I could have also declared it in the Kotlin code, but I don't know, I just thought maybe this would work. So what I want to do here is um, in my layout on the screen, I have a spinner, and I'm going to use that array of puppy images as the entries for the spinner. So these images are the ones that are listed here. Now, crucially, this list is incomplete. I think the idea was like, oh, maybe since I made the list, they added some new images. So I, I want it to be better once we make it connect to the internet to get the list of files. But for now, some of the files I have a list of here. Um, so they're in the spinner. I want to make it so when you click show, it'll say which one did they choose, and then it'll download that one and show it on the screen here, okay? So I think that looks a little bit like this. Um, in the, in the on-click of the show button, I'll write a function called on click show. So when you click show, it will go here. So basically what I want to do is um, uh, display the image that is currently selected in the spinner. Get it? The spinner is called puppy spinner. So if you say puppy spinner dot selected item position maybe that would tell me the index in, uh, val index equals that uh, if I want the actual text of the item I think what I can do is I could say val pups equals uh, I want the array uh, resources dot get string array named r dot array dot puppy images Okay, so this is an object that is equivalent to this array right here, yeah? And this is the index within that array that I'm interested in. So like <coughs> val pup equals pups bracket index, right? So like that's gonna be like quote Barney and Clyde 4 dot jpeg. You know what I mean? That that variable pup is gonna be that file name. Okay. Now what? That's the, that's the image they want to see. Yeah? Can you use the Picasso uh, method? Yeah, like use Picasso to show that picture. So uh, instead of load that file, I'll say pup. But it's not just pup, because I have to give the whole Marty step doc. That, that's up here. I made a constant called website directory, martystep.com slash dogs. So what if I do like dollar website directory slash dollar post. So it'd be Marty Step slash dogs slash Barney and Clyde 12. Or that, that's, I think that'll be the right URL. Uh, maybe I won't rotate it, but I'll just put it into that image on the screen there. Okay. Let's try it out. I 
also have two cats. They will not be making an appearance in today's lecture, but I realize that some of y'all are itching for some cat, so uh, I will get on that pretty soon. There will be cat-related content someday. Uh, so if I if I choose like Barney and Clyde three, and I say show. You have two. Yeah. Hey, so is that did I have a bug or a mistake? No, it's okay. Yeah, there's Clyde. These. Uh, do the cats have Facebook pages? No, I don't think they do. Wait, why is he? Sa I think that's just the photo is that way. I think. Um, I don't think the cats have Facebook pages. Um, I will double check uh, if you would like me to ask them to make Facebook pages for themselves. I could I could look into that. Um, how about Daisy? There's Daisy. Uh, uh Barney and Clyde are half Labrador, half border collie and Daisy here is half Labrador half French Bulldog I don't quite know how the geometry worked on mom and dad on that but uh, they made it happen so there's Daisy um, so anyway cool right puppy viewer Picasso made that pretty easy for us to do um, questions so far like does this sort of make sense like what Picasso does or why you'd want it or any kind of library related stuff how I set this up or anything you feel like you could get this to work. Yeah. So if you were to run this app, would you need the internet to be able to load the photos? If the phone or your computer with a fake emulator on it did not have a working internet connection, then it wouldn't load the images. Yeah, it wouldn't work. Um, if you had downloaded them and put them in the Drabble file or the Drabble folder, would you be able to do it without an internet connection? If you, so if you put them in the drawable resource folder, then you could load them up without an internet connection. But instead of saying dot load from this URL, you'd have to say load from r dot drawable dot whatever. That would be fine. It would work, except that um, you know you wouldn't be able to dynamically like the one of the nice points of this is just that like the image set could update over time, and the app maybe could notice that and react to that. You know, but yeah, if you had a fixed set of images, you could write this exact same code. And just use R dot whatever, and it would be fine, and you wouldn't need an internet connection. Yeah. So anyway, that's kind of basic usage of Picasso. Any other any other questions about it so far? Well, I think the thing that's missing is like I don't like this hard coded array of image file names. I'd like to fix that. So darn, if only I could like connect to the internet and like download a file and look at it and stuff, but that's kind of hard. Ah, oh, geez, it, that's going to be really tough to get that to work in Android. Oh well. Well, let's just go look at the slides and see what's next. Oh wow, cool! An internet yeah. library. Uh, so um, there's there's definitely uh, lots of nice libraries for doing stuff on the internet in Android. Now, I will say, Android comes with classes that allow you to connect to the internet and like download stuff. You know, I, that that might you should always ask yourself that question. Like, wait, why is there a library for this? Like doesn't Android come with that? You know, like that should always be a question that you have. Like, why use a library for this if I don't need it, right? Um, and I think the answer is that, yeah, Android comes with facilities to do internet stuff, but it's just kind of clunky and hard to use and weird. And like somebody said, that's too hard. Let me make it simpler. And they wrote a library for that. It's called Ion. Now, I will confess, um, just like all the libraries that I'm going to show you today, there's always some competing product. Like I just showed you Picasso for images. There's another library called Glide that does images. There's people who think Glide is way better than Picasso. And there's also people who think Picasso is way better than Glide. What's the difference? Well, go Google it. I mean, I don't know. One of them has this feature and the other one has that feature. And it's just, you know, there's always two or three or four options here. Um, I'm trying to show you ones that I like, that I think are good. I wouldn't show you a library that I thought was like not worth learning about. But at the same time, like, I will say when it comes, so Picasso is like either the best image library for Android or is like at the top and people argue about which one is the best. So I think it's legit to learn about. Ion is probably like the fourth most used internet connection library for Android. So most people who want to do internet stuff with Android use this library called OK HTTP. And most of the people who don't use that use one called Volley. And so in general, I would want to show you one of those. But like, I'm a teacher. I like showing things that are elegant and simple and easy to understand. And like, I don't like those libraries. I think they're kind of bulky and 
yucky and I just kind of don't like them. So I like ion because it's simple. All I want is like as close to like URL, give me data, process data. I just want that. I, just, I don't want to have to say a lot beyond that, you know? And ion lets you do that. But anyway, that's what this library is. I guess I'm just saying like, this is not the most popular Android internet library, but it's my favorite one. So uh, if you want to use ion, you put this line of code into your uh, XML file, the uh, build.gradle here. Sorry, it's not an XML file, into your Gradle file. There, I save it, I sync it. And also, since this is an internet library, you would have needed that internet permission if you were going to use it for anything. But I already have that, so I don't need to do that again. Um, oh, and then in terms of the documentation, like again, each of these sites, they usually have a GitHub or some kind of like page where you open it up and, you know, GitHub pages can be a little intimidating if you're not used to them, but usually you sort of scroll down. It's like it's got the code files. You don't need to download these things. Don't worry about this. But usually you get to some sort of page of instructions, blah, 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 blah. It starts showing you here, here's some code, here's how to do this, and here's how to do that. And they just show you little code samples. And then somewhere down at the bottom, they'll say, you know, here's how to add this to your project. Just like I, we saw that a little bit with Picasso. So, um, okay, so now that we have Ion, what can you do with it? Well, the simplest thing I think that you can do with Ion is just tell it to download from a URL. Um, you start out by saying ion.with this. And when I say this, I mean your activity. And if you're not in your activity right now, like if you're in a fragment or something, usually you can refer to the activity by saying activity or something. Like you, you should have some way of passing the activity as a parameter to this thing. Um, so you say ion with this, and then you say dot load dot as, you can say as string, as JSON, as binary. There's these different formats you can ask for the data in. I'm gonna say as string in my example, because I want to download a text file and I want to manipulate its contents as a string. So you have to tell it like what type of data you're dealing with. Then you say dot set callback, and the callback function is a lambda function that's going to get called when the data is done downloading. So you put in braces, and it strangely has two parameters, an exception and a result. The exception is if it didn't work. Like if it was unable to connect or something, it'll have an exception for you here. And if it did work, the string of data will be called result. And so you can process that result here. Bless you. So that's it. I mean, that's pretty simple to me. I mean, some of that looks a little weird. A lot of these libraries have some kind of a library name dot with this. Like they often have that sort of a syntax. And the reason they do that is because a lot of these libraries are using functionality within your activity and they're building on top of that. And so they need you to like pass your activity to them as a parameter so that they can use your activity to help them. So that's kind of why it says with this. Um, so that's all you got to do. And remember, what I want to do here is I want to get those images, get the list of all the names, the file names of all those images, and I want to put those into the spinner so I can choose from those. So um, if I just, I mean, I can just copy this. If I if I bring this back over to the project here, when when do I want to download this list of images? Where in my code should that go? When do I download this and process it? Yeah. On create. Yeah, when the activity, when the app loads up, like on create, I want to go get the list of the images and show it, right? So let's go back to the app here in on create. I'll just paste that. Uh, it doesn't know what ion is, but I just hit Alt Enter. I import ion, and now I don't say as type. The type I want is called as string. And now here it's ready for me to uh, write this callback code that's going to run when the data is ready. So uh, what do I want to do? Well, um, the website directory is here, and the list of files is called files.txt. So I think the URL I want to deal with is website directory slash list of files. Right? Oh, question. Yeah. Do you need to define exception, or is there a good default exception? So if you don't care about error handling, you can just put underscore for that. But you have to have two parameters. It just makes you do that, unfortunately. I mean, it's considered bad practice to connect to a remote target and not have any kind of error handling because like, there's quite a lot of reasons why that might not work. I mean, obviously, the internet connection could be down. It could be laggy and it could time out. It could connect properly, but that file is missing. 
there's all kind of weird stuff that could happen, right? So it's considered sloppy to just ignore all of those possible things that could go wrong. But that's what I'm going to do. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, if I were writing this to be at all like legit of an app, I would I would check and look at the exception and see like what is its state and was there an error. And if there was, I'd toast or it's something. I would I would you know tell the user something. But oh well, limited class time, you know. Um, so this result is literally just a string of the full contents of that file that I downloaded. So I mean, I could even show you, I just, I think a, a really nice first step is like, if I get the data, let's just print it out to the log. So let's do log.d for debug, uh, marty, comma, result, or, or maybe I would say like, uh, oops, uh, I would say something like the file text is uh, dollar result, you know, something like that. That's pretty easy, right? Um, so if I, just run that. Now when the app pops up, it should hopefully, cross your fingers, hey look, the file text is, and it prints all the, the text of the different file names, right? Cool. Okay, so I want those file names to be in here, I mean, it might look like they already are, but I hope you understand, like, I made that array in my XML file, and I put a few of these files in there just so I could test it. The stuff I'm seeing on the console is not in there, I just, they happen to have some overlap, you understand? So, uh, how do I get these file names to be listed in here, in this spinner thing? So <clears throat> I think almost everything you said is, is on the right track. Like you said, take the files, split it apart, break it apart, parse it, put it into like an array list or list or something, right? Put it into a collection. Um, the last step you said was, can I then sort of put that into the string XML file? That's the only part where I would stray from what you said, which is I don't want to take the strings in this file and sort of put them into XML. That XML is going to get like baked into my app and it doesn't get modified. But I do want to take that array list and somehow tell the spinner, please use that array list to be your items, right? How do you tell a spinner or a list like what its items should be? Yeah. Isn't there like a specific spinner adapter? So you use an adapter. We use adapters in homework too. It's the same. The adapter that you use for a list view also works for a spinner. So I, I think we can do this uh, pretty, pretty clean here. So what you do is you say um, uh, result dot split slash n. That's going to split it into a list of lines. I think. Uh, what's the data? It's a list bracket string. So val lines equals result dot split slash n. And then if you want that to be what's in the spinner, spinner is called puppy spinner you say dot adapter equals, and we'll make a new adapter. Now in our homework two, we made the adapter into a private variable probably, so you could update it over time as the to-do list changed. But I think in this app, it's just gonna be set when the app loads up, set it and forget it. I don't think we need to save it as a private var, so I think I can just say make an adapter of strings. Remember adapter takes three parameters, or it's called array adapter, sorry. Um, Right, you remember this? You just did this on homework too, right? What are the three parameters? This, and then like that layout, like android.r.layout. You just copied this probably from the slide. <laughs> Simple list item underscore one. And then the third parameter is the list of the lines, you know, the actual list to use in the adapter, right? So I think that's it. Just split it into the lines, put it in the spinner. Um, the only thing is we might want this to be saved so we know what all the different images are. So maybe I'll go up here and I'll say private var uh, all images, which is a, which is an is it a list of string, or I guess um, equals a list of nothing or something. Isn't that how you say it? Or mutable list of 
nothing. I don't know, whatever. It's just an empty list. And then here, maybe instead of lines equals, I might say uh, all images equals. Does that work? Oh, maybe this needs to be. Uh, is that not the right? Is that not the right way to say that? List of string? Yeah, OK, there we go. Sorry. Um, so I have this as like a private var. And then when I read the data, I just save it in my private var. And then this becomes all lines. Yeah, question? Um, how do we know that like, that shouldn't be a valid? Like, can we know that it's going to change memory? Well, so um, the reason I want it to be a var is because I'm setting it equal to something more than once. What I could do is I could say late init. And then I could say its type is list string, but not give it a value. And then here, I could assign its value. And then since I'm only assigning it once, then I could say val. That would be fine. Wait, is that not like that? Laden it is only allowed on mute. Oh, so it has to be var, sorry. But it's, um, so I could do that. So then technically, it's uninitialized until here. The way I had it a second ago was I set it to be an empty list. I guess I was a little scared, like maybe if I tried mashing the screen before the download was done, I didn't want it to crash because the list was null. Or, I don't know if it really matters. I, I think what you would probably do if you wanted to do this the right way would be that you would um, gray out the button like um, uh, in the layout here, this button you would set the, what is the property uh, disabled or, or is it uh, um, enabled? Enabled false. And so it's gray. I don't know if you can see it on the screen there. It's gray. But then like once you get the data and put it in there and you've set this all up, then you would say, uh, what's the button called? Show button. You'd say show, whoops, uh, show button dot is enabled equals true. I think that would like turn it clickable app. So that would probably make it so we don't have any issues, right? Um, is there is there an error? Unresolved reference all lines. What's the? Oh, it's all images. Sorry, all images. OK. OK, so I think I think we're pretty good here. Let me let me try to run that. Um, to really make sure it's working, I think what I'm going to do is in the spinner here, I'm going to like turn off this entries thing so it just doesn't have anything in it. So that way, if it gets anything in there, it's because the ION library did its job, you know? So let's run it and see. It's compiling right now. Hey, look. Now it's got all the images. It's got more than it had before. So I think it must be getting that data from that uh, URL. Now I can click on like Daisy 20 show. Oops. Oh, <laughs> so. Um, it crashed uh, because this logic here is still using that string array to figure out what the image is. And we don't use the string array anymore. So it's not an array of pups that come from the XML. It's um, all images index, I think, is the, is the all images. That's our private var that we made. So I think that's why it crashed. Um, <laughs> try it again. So they're all there. And I'll pick the last one, because that's the most crashy one of them. And then I say show. Hey, there we go. Wow, my hair was really short. Ah, yes, those were the days. Um, so anyway, yeah, like it's working, right? Pretty cool. And then I, I guess, again, the point is like maybe maybe you're a little underwhelmed, because it's like there's not that many lines of code. It's just kind of simple, you know? Or maybe you're just sort of medium whelmed, but you're not overwhelmed. I don't know what. But like uh, a lot of these libraries have that nature to them, where like once you figure out how to use them, the code is only like eight lines long. But that's good. That's a good thing. The whole point of the library is to make the code shorter and easier and simpler. And of course, there's a bunch of other options for ION. You can use it to download data from web services in the JSON format. You can download binary data in other formats and play with that. And you can set up uh, multiple concurrent connections and proxies and login credentials and all these crazy things. And I don't, I don't need to do that for this demo today. But like, it has more stuff you can read about in its documentation page linked from our slides today if you want to. Yeah. Um, is there a way to do like, private static variables? Like, what's the equivalent in copy? Are you initialized variable once? Uh, the equivalent of a static. So yeah, I mostly have been dodging that because uh, I'm, I'm sort of trying to teach you the 
critical path of Kotlin that you need and not to do kind of a Kotlin language celebration where we play with all of the silly features. But um, Kotlin, so yeah, you guys might know like static stuff in object context would be like something that's shared among the whole class of objects, right? Like as opposed to uh, non-static stuff is replicated into each instance, each object of the class, but static is sort of globally shared by all instances of the class. Um, and that's a concept that is present in a lot of object-oriented languages like Java, C++, et cetera, and mostly just say static on a given variable or function to indicate whether it's that way. So Kotlin, the designers of Kotlin decided they don't want to have the concept of static. They don't want a class to be allowed to have stuff in it. Um, they want objects to have stuff in them because I think part of the reasoning there is they always want code to be running in the context of some object. They always want the word this to have meaning in every moment in Kotlin code. That's like a principle they think is important or something. If you're static, they, you are no this. So they didn't like that, that di dichotomy. So um, the, the most nearby feature to static, like if you basically want something to be static, Kotlin has a feature called a companion object and a companion object is like a little object that lives in the puppy activity class and now it has those variables inside of it and if you want to refer to him you can say puppy activity dot website directory and it'll refer to that object's website it's basically that's where you put static stuff is in this companion object the main difference is that even though it's sort of global to the class, it is in an object, I guess. So I find that a little weird, so I just, I hadn't mentioned it. But like if you, I think the only time that I've encountered that I really wanted to use this syntax, like the rest of my code actually still works fine with it this way. The only context where I found I would want to use this is if you're in some other class, foo or something, and you're in the function called bar, and then you go, oh, I really wish I could refer to that website directory. If you say puppy activity dot website directory, you can do that now because it's in this companion object. If it weren't, it's like not something that that code can see because it's not a member of puppy activity. It's a member of each individual puppy activity object. So yeah, <laughs> anyway, I, I don't know if I, if we all regret asking this question at this point, but yeah, like that's basically how you make something static in uh, in Kotlin. Yeah. Um, any other any other questions about Ion so far? Is it clear kind of what this is doing? How it's working and stuff. One one thing I've seen. Oh yeah, question. Go ahead. Can you just quickly explain how you figured out how to split the uh, like the slash n? This? Okay, sure. Um, it's just because the, f the particular file that I'm downloading looks like that. That's the file. I would think of it, just pretend that's a text file on your hard drive. I happen to be downloading it, but it's the same as if I were reading it in from the disk. It's just a string, and those are just file names with line breaks between them. And so I want those file names to be separate, and I want to take each file name and add it into like a list of strings, and then I want to turn that list into an adapter in the spinner. And so the way to take this giant string with slash n, slash n, slash n, the, that whole thing as one long string, the way to turn that into a list of each file name is to split it or break it apart on slash n. I could have made like a scanner and while next line, I could have read the line from this, that would also work. But split is a nice way if you just have all the text to split it into the lines basically. So I mean, that's the, the nature of the file I was reading for today's example was that it was split by line breaks, right? Um, one thing I've seen that people run into is they get a little bit confused about when various code runs. Now, obviously, this code that we're looking at here is in the onCreate function. So it runs when the app loads up, when the activity gets created. I think you understand that. But one of the things about this set callback, this code right here in these curly braces, it runs when Ion has finished retrieving the data. So you have to pretend for a second. Imagine a world like Stanford where we have really slow internet connections, you know? So like when you say, hey, I want to connect to this site, I want to download this file, and I want to look at the string inside, it might take like several seconds for that to get back to your device, okay? 
So what is happening while your code is waiting for the data to come back? Well, you know, certainly ION is waiting for the file to arrive, and then when it does arrive, it will execute this stuff here. That's fine. But like, if you put something here, like log dot d marty hello or whatever, this line of code will execute before this stuff does, because like. Ion starts up, it's going to wait for the data. When the data arrives, it's going to run this. But until the data arrives, it just sort of exits back out of there. And if there's any other code down here, it'll let it run and stuff. It doesn't like block your whole app sitting here. Because if it did block, the app wouldn't pop up on the screen. You know, on create would not uh, return, you know? So, I mean, I guess, I guess the, I was trying to think if I could simulate this properly. Uh, I don't think I can insert a fake delay into the um, code here, but like, you know, I could insert, like, I think I can say, can I say thread.sleep 1000 or 2000 or something? This is just make the thing sleep for a certain amount of time. What I want to show here is um, when I run this, the thing's going to be empty and the button's going to be grayed out, but this log message is going to appear ahead of that, I think. So let me, let me try to run that and show you. Uh, so let me pop up the log cat and let me type Marty. Oh, it's under error. It should be debug. Dang it. <laughs> I didn't get that set up fast enough, I don't think. Clear. Hello, see? And then it's still, it's, did you see how the hello popped up first? So like, I think some students get a little confused because like they initiate some sort of download here or some sort of operation. And then they're like, okay, well after that I wanna do some other stuff. And they put the other stuff right there. And then it crashes because the thing up above hasn't run yet. And they're just code is running out of order versus what they thought it was gonna do. So um, that has to do with the fact that there's like threads going on here. I, I have not talked about that. I will. I will talk about concurrency and thread kind of issues and how they affect Android apps later in the course. But like suffice it to say that like it kind of does that in the background. Um, uh, you, you had a, a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so we were just talking about sort of like static, static methods, static uh, variables. Um, and it looks like this thread.sleep method is like, you know, but there's no object thread. Right. That's a static method. So yeah. that's a static method um, within the scope of what some some thread that's happening. Well, that's so on. yeah, I mean, sort of big picture. I don't want to go into detail too much about threads or what that is exactly, but um, sort of just to be clear about the syntax and what's happening. There's a class named thread, and it has a companion object that has a function inside of it called sleep. Yeah, okay. So the syntax for talking to that companion object is to write the class's name. And then if you say a dot and then a variable or a function name, it will look inside the companion object for them. Now, to be fair, the thread class existed since Java time. So Java stuff really does have static methods and mm -hmm. stuff in it. And Kotlin talks to that stuff. So that might actually be a static method. But Kotlin classes that have methods that are companion object methods, you'd call them in that way. So anyway, I'm going to erase it. But let me ask you a different question. If I want something to happen after the data is arrived and processed and stuff like that, if I really want this to print after all the images have appeared in the list, how do I accomplish that if this does not accomplish that? Yeah? Create a function which is called at the end of the callback. Call a function at the end of the callback? Yeah, just like right here. Do it here. And so, I mean, you say write a function, that's fine. You could even just like, oops, you could even just put this here, right? <laughs> just, it should be in there or it should be invoked from there. I mean, you've got exactly the right idea, which is like the person who initiates the process of printing this must be in here right after that. That's where you know that code has finished running. So I know that seems like a small thing, like moving this from here to there or vice versa, but it kind of is a big deal in terms of when stuff happens. So maybe something to be mindful of, okay? All right, so uh, I got a couple more libraries. I'll show you a little faster because we kind of don't have a ton of minutes left here, but 
I hope you're sort of getting the idea of like how libraries work and stuff like that. Let me show you a couple other things. There's a few more things here I'm not going to talk about, but you can also use ION to download images and stuff, but we don't need to do that. So um, let me show you. I, I just wanted to show you one that was like a little more lighthearted. There's an animation library. And unlike the other two I just showed you, those other two are like pretty legit libraries. They're made by companies. They're made by like big open source people. This library is made by some guy named Daimajia. And on his GitHub page, he says, uh, I'm a student in mainland China. Please hire me or something. <laughs> and it's like, he's just some guy. Just some guy made this library. But I'm trying to show you the breadth of stuff here. There's libraries made by some guy, and there's libraries made by big companies and everything in between. And he decided he wanted a library for just some fun animation effects. And if you want his library, here's the web page for documentation on it, and here's the, the stuff you paste into your file. So let me just go do that real quick. This library is fun. It's a little more for fun than some of the other ones. So paste. I pasted those three lines right there. Oh, wait, this doesn't work. Uh, Maybe there's a new version of that. Oh, it says 28. Let me see if I can tell it to replace with 28. OK, maybe I have to update that slide. Sometimes these libraries that they did. Oh, it's actually it's already up there, isn't it? I already got that thing. So maybe I'll delete that. Sorry, I, I think I need, to, I need to update that line to maybe get rid of it or something. But um, OK, so anyway, once you have this library, here are some of the kind of stuff that it does. You can make widgets kind of wobble or spin or bonk or fade or just stuff like that. And I think the idea is just like that can make your app a little more fun, a little more silly. Like when they click the buttons, the buttons wiggle and stuff. You know? There's lots of different stuff that you can do with it. And I mean, I think that the real appeal of it is just like really dead simple to use. So um, let me try to show you real fast. The style of this is, I have no idea why, the library is called Yo-Yo. But I don't understand why it's called. The library isn't named Yo-Yo in the GitHub, but the class is called Yo-Yo. I don't get it. I don't know. You write Yo-Yo with, and then you say techniques dot, and then you write some effect you want to do. And then you can say dot and set some other effects, like attributes of the effect. And then you, when you're done with all that, you say play on, and you tell it what widget to do that effect to. If that sounds weird, look, you, I think if you look at an example, it'll make more sense. So like. Um, Here's some of the different animations and options you can do. And go look at his webpage if you want to see a list of them all. You can flash and pulse and swing and shake and wobble and bounce and wave. And you can bounce up and left and right and down. And you can fade and all these different things. And there you go. You can rotate and slide and zoom. Let's just do one. They're all as good as each other. So you do something like, uh, oh, I have to sync my thing. Now in my puppy activity, maybe when you click the um, show an image button. We want to wiggle waggle the button or something like that. So you just say like yo yo uh, dot with techniques dot and then which animation you want. Let's do wobble. <laughs> um, and then you can say kind of dot you know, and you can say set or there's different things you can set like you can say the duration. Let's wobble for two seconds and then let's play that on the button for showing. I think it's called the show button. So you pass the variable, the, the object that refers to that widget. So in our code, we could just refer to that by that ID there. So that's it. I mean, that's all you have to do. Now you can make things wobble. So like, if I run this app with this new library, Brace yourselves. This is going to be pretty badass. I just got to warn you. Uh, so if I pick Barney and Clyde 7 and I click here, whoa, <laughs> whoa. I mean, whatever, right? There's, I, I, I do want you to see, you know, there's like that old saying from um, Apple and iPhone, like there's an app for that. I really think that if there's something here, it's like there's a library for that. Like if you want your widget to spin around and wobble and make a fart sound, like there is a library that does that basically. And it's probably not that hard. You just Google it and find the library and put the line in and put the thing in and then it does it. It's kind of cool to just go grab these things off the shelf and then your app does cool new stuff. Um, I've only got a couple minutes left, but let me, I, I think I can show you one more thing really fast, which is, um, you know, I'm done with that animation thing, but that was kind of just for fun. Um, here, here's one more real quick. Uh, blah, blah, blah. This one's called Android Bootstrap. 
If you've seen Bootstrap, it's like a web uh, UI library with lots of pretty widgets and colors and thingies that you can do. And somebody ported most of the concepts from that library over to Android. So it make it a little easier for you to make different cool colored buttons and circular thingies and slidey thingies and just kind of more widgets and prettier widgets. And some people really think this looks neat. And I haven't used this very much in my Androiding life, but like some people really like this. So if you want this Bootstrap library, you just grab like this and you put it into your app just like the other ones there and I sync and now what's interesting about this one is you mostly do stuff now in the XML that's new not in the Kotlin so like if you go back here there's a whole bunch of different kind of widgets that start with bootstrap so this looks kind of weird but instead of saying button you'd say like com dot whatever dot whatever dot bootstrap button and I mean, go look at their documentation back here to see all how to do this or whatever. But basically what you do is like, go back to my app, go back to my layout. I got this button here. I could make this, instead of a button, I could type bootstrap button. Yes, I'll press enter. And now, like, I think where it gets a little confusing is you have to add a couple new properties to it. And their page kind of describes all this stuff. But like, I just kind of set up an example here. Like, if I grab these, brand and size and mode and outline and rounded corner you know if I set these different properties basically this button I don't know if it's going to update on the little preview thing here but it turns into kind of a pretty colored button or whatever I think if I just run this I'm hoping that'll work let's see it's it's re uh, compiling and stuff <clears throat> So now I have this like cool green button, you know, and so it's like you, you can mess with the configuration and you can make it have pretty colors and rounded corners and I mean, I, I'm just kind of scratching the surface here, but I kind of wanted to show you that just library and then declare your button as a bootstrap button and set a couple properties and now it looks different and you have cool looking widgets and so there's actually a whole set of libraries that are like widget libraries like here's a cooler button and here's a circular spinner widget and here's a you know vertical horizontal slider widget and here's a bunch of different stuff and if you look at the documentation for these libraries you can look through and see all the different kind of widgets that they provide so that's pretty cool if you want to make a more <laughs> like rich looking UI okay well I'm gonna stop there because I'm basically out of time but those are some of the libraries and uh, please go to your sections and I will catch all of you on Thursday thanks